Section 8 of Wayside and Woodland Trees, A Pocket Guide to the British Silva, by Edward Stepp. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Exotic Trees and Shrubs, Part 1 We have already given descriptions and illustrations of several exotic species in Part 1, where it seemed more advantageous to the reader to include them with the British species of the same genus. Those now to be dealt with are, in all cases, members of genera not represented in our native flora. The Plain Platanus Orientalis In spite of the fact that the plain is an exotic of comparatively recent introduction, it seems in a fair way of being associated in the future with London. It has taken with great kindness to London life, in spite of the drawbacks of smoke, fog, flagstones, and asphalt. Its leaves get thickly coated with soot, which also turns its light gray bark to black, but as the upper surface of the leaves is smooth and firm, a shower of rain washes them clean, and the rigid outer layer of bark is thrown off by the expansion of the softer bark beneath. This is not thrown off all at once, but in large and small flakes, which leave a smooth yellow patch behind, temporarily free from soot contamination. A variety of trees has been tried for street planting, but none has stood the trying conditions of London so well as the plain, and therefore before many years the capital will be the city of plains. Two species are recognized, the Oriental Plain, Platanus orientalis, and the Western Plain, P. occidentalis but it would probably be more accurate to regard them as geographical varieties of one species, the points in which they differ being small and not very important. Thus the leaves of the Oriental Plain are described as being so much more deeply lobed than those of the Western Plain, that the former are botanically described as palmate, but the two forms of leaf may often be found on the same individual. The Western Plain, too, does not shed its bark in small flakes like the oriental plain, but in large sheets. Plains normally rise to a height of something between 70 and 90 feet, and the trunk attains a circumference of from 9 to 12 feet, but there is a record of a portly plain whose waist measurement was 40 feet. Many persons imagine, because the leaves of the plain resemble those of the sycamore, that the two are closely related. But this is not so, and a comparison of the flowers and fruit will show that they are not. The catkins of the plain take the form of balls, in which male or female flowers are pressed together, and the fruits, instead of being winged samaras, are the rough balls that so closely resemble an old-fashioned form of button, that the tree is known in some parts of the United States as the button wood. It is also known there as sycamore and cotton tree. The plain is supposed to have got its name platanus from the greek word platus broad in double allusion to the broad leaves and the ample shadow which the tree throws these leaves are five lobed and as already indicated those of the oriental species are much more deeply cut further distinction is found in the color of the petiole or leaf stalk which is green in p orientalis and purplish red in p occidentalis and in the larger and smoother seed buttons of the latter. Instead of the leaves being attached to the stem in pairs, as we saw in the sycamore, those of the plain are alternate, that is to say, leaf number two of a series will be halfway between leaf one and three, but on the opposite side of the shoot. The outline of the tree is not so regular as in most others, the leaves being gathered in heavy masses, with broad spaces between, rather than equally distributed over the head. This is, of course, due to the freedom with which the crooked arms are flung about. The pale brown wood is fine-grained, tough, and hard, and is extensively used by pianoforte makers, coach builders, and cabinet makers, but is not highly esteemed for other purposes to which timber is put in this country. The Oriental Plain is popularly supposed to have been introduced to England from the Levant by Francis Bacon. But if Loudon's statement that it was in British gardens before 1548 rests on good evidence, Bacon's claim is dismissed, for he was not introduced until 1561. It was nearly a hundred years later, 1640, 
that the occidental plane was first brought from virginia by the younger tradescant and planted in that remarkable garden of his father's in south lambeth road the form that has done so well in london and of which many fine examples are to be seen in the parks and squares is a variety of the oriental plane with leaves less deeply divided than those of the type and therefore more nearly approaching the occidental plane in this respect it is distinguished by the name of the maple leafed plane platanus orientalis variant acerfiolia it is this variety that we have chosen as the subject for our photograph the walnut juglans regia in the golden age when man lived happily on a handful of acorns the gods fed upon walnuts and so their name was jovis glans the nuts of jupiter since contracted into juglans those who delight in obvious interpretations by appealing to the modern meanings of words similar in construction may be pardoned for supposing that walnut trees were formerly trained against walls but like many other obvious interpretations this is wide of the mark some have gone back to the anglo-saxons for help and though the result arrived at is in all probability the correct one it is almost certain that the anglo-saxons knew nothing of the matter and would scarcely trouble to give a name to something they had never seen the walnut is a native of the himalayas the hindu ku persia lebanon and asia minor to greece the learned roman varro who was born b c 116 and died b c 28 mentions it as existing in italy in his day and pliny tells us it was brought thence from persia the date of its introduction to britain is usually set down as about the middle of the sixteenth century but it was probably at least a century earlier for gerard writing at the close of the sixteenth century describes it as a tree commonly to be seen in orchards and in fields near the highways where a very new importation was not likely to be found but to return to the name there can be little doubt that it is a contraction of walsh nut in modern spelling welsh nut meaning foreign this is german and while the modern sons of the vader land write it volnus occasionally volschenus the dutch form is walnut that this is the true derivation is made pretty certain by gerard who calls it walnut and of some walsh nut that the new importation was fully appreciated in europe for its fruit may be judged by the extent to which its cultivation has spread in evelyn's day for he tells us that the trees abounded in burgundy where they stood in the midst of goodly wheatlands he says in several places betwixt hanau and frankfurt in germany no young farmer is permitted to marry a wife till he bring proof that he hath planted and is a father of such a slated number of walnut trees and the law is inviolably observed to this day for the extraordinary benefit the tree affords the inhabitants the walnut is a handsome tree growing to a height of forty to sixty feet with a bole twenty feet or more in circumference and a huge spreading head the bark is of a cool gray color smooth when young but as the tree matures deep longitudinal furrows form and it becomes very rugged the twisted branches take a direction more upward than horizontal but in early summer they are almost completely hidden by the masses of large and handsome leaves of warm green color and spicy aroma i once rejoiced in the occupation of a garden that held two walnut trees and though they had not attained to the fruiting age their possession was a delight to me but then i am one of those who enjoy their fragrance which is unbearable to some persons the large leaves are formed after the fashion of the ash leaf broken up into a variable number of lance-shaped leaflets with scarcely perceptible teeth the flowering of the walnut is much on the plan of the oak and the hazel the sexes being in different flowers but borne by one tree the males forming a long drooping catkin of slender cylindrical form the females being solitary or a few grouped at the end of a shoot separated from the catkin the males will each be seen to consist of a calyx of five greenish scales enclosing a large number of stamens the calyx of the female closely invests the ovary which has two or three fleshy stigmas the flowering takes place in early spring before the leaf buds have burst the fruit is a plum like droop only the enveloping green flesh becomes brown and splitting irregularly discloses the stone 
which in this species takes the form of a hard but thin-shelled nut, the well-known walnut, with its wrinkled kernel of crisp white flesh from which a fine oil is obtained. The ripening of these nuts, which is accomplished by the beginning of October, can only be relied upon in the southern half of Britain, even there the crop is often spoiled by late frosts in the spring. Its chief value in Europe is as a fruit tree, though the light but tough wood is much esteemed for the manufacture of furniture. Owing to its rapid growth, the grain is coarse, but the dark brown color is esteemed, especially as it is relieved by streaks and veins of lighter tints and black. It is easily worked and bears a high polish. The wood of young trees is white, gradually deepening to brown as maturity is approached. All the juices of the tree, whether from the wood, bark, leaves, or green fruit, are rich in the brown pigment to which the hue of the timber is due. The combined lightness and toughness of the wood led to its adoption as the favorite material for making the stocks of guns and rifles. It is said that so great was the demand for this purpose during the Peninsular War that a single walnut tree realized 600 pounds for its timber, and this created a boom that led to the cutting down of all our finest walnut trees. Some of these were doubtless the very trees referred to by Evelyn, who tells us the walnut was extensively planted at Leatherhead in Surrey, also at Caswalton, Carshalton, and Goodston in the same county, where the rambler may come across fine walnut trees to this day, and occasionally to young ones growing wild in hedgerows and wastes. The old doggerel adage, a dog and a wife and a walnut tree, the more they are beaten, the better they be, has reference to the manner of harvesting the ripe fruit. Evelyn says, in Italy they armed the tops of long poles with nails and iron for the purpose of loosening the fruit, and believe the beating improves the tree, which I no more believe than I do that discipline would reform a shrew. He expresses no opinion on the question of beating dogs. Sweet Chestnut Castanea Sativa Until about the middle of the last century, the chestnut was generally regarded as a genuine native of these islands. It is true that botanists felt that so large and longevous a tree, if native, should be found in the natural forests of this country, or even forming pure forest. These things they did not find, but, on the other hand, they were shown beams in ancient buildings, including Westminster Abbey, which were believed to be chestnut wood, and this evidence seemed to point to the fact that chestnut timber was grown much more plentifully in this country at the period when these old buildings were erected. Dr. Lindley, however, set the matter at rest by examination of the reputed chestnut beams in the roof of Westminster Abbey, and proved that they were of Dermast oak. A similar examination of the timbers of the old Louvre in Paris, which were also reputed to be chestnut, gave a similar result. A comparison of sections across the grain of oak and chestnut allows of no possibility of mistake, and it is now known that whilst the wood of young chestnuts is tough and durable, that from old trees is brittle and comparatively worthless, except for firewood, which is exactly the opposite of oak wood. It is now generally agreed that its real home is in Asia Minor and Greece, whence it was introduced to Italy in very remote times, and has since spread over most of temperate Europe, its seeds ripening and sowing themselves wherever the vine flourishes. We appear to be indebted to our friends the Romans for its introduction to Britain, who no doubt hoped to utilize the fruit for food, as at home, a hope that must have been disappointed, for its crops, even in the south of England, are very fitful, and the nuts quite small. In suitable situations, the chestnut is of larger proportions and greater length of life even than the oak. In the south of England, it will attain a height of from 60 to 80 feet in 50 or 60 years, and if growing in deep porous loam, free from carbonate of lime, and sheltered from strong winds and frosts, it builds up an erect massive column. Hamerton has said of such a tree, his expression is that of sturdy strength, his trunk and limbs are built, not like those of Apollo, but like the trunk and limbs of Hercules. Under less suitable conditions, the divided trunk is little more than ten feet long, and it divides off into several huge limbs, and so the general character of the tree is altered, and it presents much the appearance of having been pollarded. The branches have a horizontal and downward habit of growth, the extremities of the lowest ones often being but little above the earth. The fine elliptical leaves are nine or ten inches in length, of a rich green, that is enhanced by the polished surface, which brings up the color. Their edges are cut into long pointed teeth, 
towards autumn they pale to light yellow and then deepen into gold on their way to the final brown of the fallen leaf which by the way is a great enricher of the soil where the chestnut is grown the flowers though individually small and inconspicuous are rather striking from their association in cylindrical yellow catkins about six inches long which hang from the axils of the leaves the upper part of this catkin consists of male flowers each with a number of stamens enclosed in a perianth or calyx of five or six green leaves the female flowers on the lower part of the catkin are two or three together in a prickly four-lobed cupule or involucre and consist each of a calyx closely investing a tapering ovary whose summit bears from five to eight radiating stigmas the number corresponding with the cells into which the ovary is divided each cell contains two seed eggs but as a rule only one in each flower develops as development of the ovary and seeds progresses the cupule also grows and ultimately entirely surrounds the cluster with the hedgehog like coat in which the nuts are contained when ripe then it splits open and discloses the two or three glossy brown nuts the chestnut is in flower from may to july and the nuts drop in october they form an important article of food in south europe where they are produced in abundance and there can be little doubt that the importers of the tree to this country believed it would prove equally valuable here evelyn had this in mind when he recommended the nuts as a lusty and masculine food for rustics at all times and of better nourishment for husbandmen than coal and rusty bacon well there is plenty of chestnut grown around evelyn's estate at wooton today but it is chiefly as coppice to provide hop poles and hoops for barrels for which purpose the long straight shoots are split in two grown as coppice the chestnut also provides fine cover for pheasants and other game the trees begin to bear when about twenty-five years old and from thence on to the fiftieth or sixtieth year the timber is at its best but later it develops the defect known as ring shake and becomes of little use that is probably why one meets with so many hollow wrecks of what were once noble chestnuts the young wood is covered with smooth brown bark but later this becomes gray and its surface splits into longitudinal fissures which give a very distinctive character to the trunk in older trees the fissures and the alternating ridges have a slight spiral twist which gives the tree the appearance shown in our third photo of having been wrenched round by some mighty force the average age of the chestnut is about five hundred years but there have been in this country many old trees that were much older if any reliance could be placed in local tradition there was we fear there is little of it still remaining the great tortworth chestnut in lord duchy's park at tortworth court in eighteen twenty it was found to have a girth of fifty-two feet evelyn refers to it in his silva and tells us that in the reign of king stephen it already bore the title of the great chestnut of tortworth the name chestnut appears to be a modification of the old latin name castanea through the french form chataigner the latin is said to be derived from castantum a town in thessaly but it is more likely that the presence of chestnut trees gave a name to the town as has happened so many times in our own country with various trees the chestnut included horse chestnut aesculus hippocastantum our placing the chestnut and the horse chestnut into juxtaposition must not be understood as a recognition of any relationship that may be implied in their names but rather the reverse to accentuate the differences that exist between them and which have led botanists to separate them widely in all systems of classification although the fruits are sufficiently similar to have suggested the name chestnut being applied to them with a qualifying prefix they have been produced by flowers of entirely different character evelyn tells us the word horse was added because of its virtues in curing horses broken-winded and other cattle of coughs a statement for which he was no doubt indebted to parkinson 1640 who says horse chestnuts are given in the east country and so through all turkey unto horses to cure them of the cough shortness of wind and other such diseases but seeing that in this country at least horses refuse to touch them there can be little doubt that the name was given to indicate their inferiority to the sweet chestnut and by a process only too well known to the student of early botanical literature the name was afterwards held to be proof of their medicinal value to horses the horse chestnut is a native of the mountain regions of greece persia and northern india and is believed to have been introduced to britain about fifteen fifty it is not a tree that will be found in the woodlands 
or even by the wayside, except when it is behind a fence. Yet it constantly greets the rambler who has left the suburban gardens behind him and in the public parks, notably the magnificent avenue of Bushy Park, where by contrast it exhibits itself as the grandest of all flowering trees. Though the stout cylindrical bole is short, its erect trunk towers to a height of eighty or a hundred feet, supporting the massive pyramid, beautiful on account of its fine foliage and handsome flowers alike. The stout branches take an upward direction at first, then stretch outward and curve downwards, though in winter, when relieved of the weight of foliage, their extremities curl sharply upward, and the great buds in spring are almost erect. These brown buds, with their numerous wraps and liberal coating of varnish, afford considerable interest to the suburban dweller in early spring. He watches their gradual swelling, and the polish that comes upon them through the daily melting of their varnish under the influence of sunshine. Then the outer scales fall flat, the upper parts show green and loose, there is a perceptible lengthening of the shoot, which leaves a space between those outer wraps and the folded leaves. Next, the leaflets separate and assume a horizontal position as they expand. Then probably there comes a frost, and next morning the leaflets are all hanging down, almost blackened, flaccid, and dejected looking. A warm southerly rain, followed by sunshine, reinvigorates them, and we see that the lengthening of the shoot has actually brought the incipient flower spike clear into view. By about the second week in May, the pyramid is clothed with bold, handsome foliage, against which the conical spikes of white blossoms, tinged with crimson and dotted with yellow, stand out conspicuously. The leaves are almost circular, but broken up, finger fashion, into seven toothed leaflets of different sizes, which appear to have started as ovals. But the necessity for not overcrowding their neighbors has necessitated the portion nearest the leaf stalk taking a wedge shape. The large size of these leaves, as much as eighteen inches across, leads the non-botanical to regard the leaflets as being full leaves. On emerging from the bud, the leaves are seen to be covered with down, but as they expand, this is thrown off. The flowers consist of a bell-shaped calyx with five lobes, supporting five separate petals, pure white in color, but splashed and dotted with crimson and yellow towards the base of the upper ones, to indicate the way to the honey glands. There are seven curved stamens, and in their midst a longer curved style proceeding from a roundish ovary with three cells. In each cell there are two seed eggs, but as a rule only one egg in two of the cells develops into a nut. The ovary develops into a large fleshy burr with short stout spines, which splits into three valves when the dark red glossy seeds are ripe. In the sweet chestnut, the brown skin of the nut is the ovary, which had been overgrown by the prickly involucre. Here the spiny green shell is the ovary, and the nut a seed. Though horses will not eat this bitter fruit, cattle, deer, and sheep are fond of it. Pounded in water, it becomes one of the numerous vegetable substitutes for soap. Under the name of conquer, or conqueror, it affords a seasonal joy to the average boy who first bombards the tree with sticks and stones to dislodge the fruit, and then threads the ruddy conkers on string and does battle with a chum similarly equipped the one whose string is broken or pulled from his hand by the conflict of weapons being the vanquished in some parts the game is led off by the recitation of the rhyme o Blianker, my first conquer the growth of the tree is very rapid and consequently the timber is soft and of no value where durability is required still its even grain and susceptibility to a high polish make it useful for indoor wood such as cabinet making and flooring it is also used for making charcoal for the gunpowder mills Although Salvatore Rosa and other landscape painters have made such good use of the sweet chestnut pictorially, they have utterly neglected the horse chestnut, and Hamerton hints that the cause of this neglect is the artist's inability to represent its large flowers and leaves by the landscape painter's ordinary method of laying on masses of color. This requires drawing. The tree begins to produce fruit about its twentieth year and continues to do so nearly every year. Its age is estimated at about two hundred years. The bark, at first smooth, breaks into irregular scales, and in old trees a twist may be developed, as illustrated by our photo of the bowl. The generic name Esculus, from Latin esca, food, has no real connection with the tree, the ancients having given it to some species of oak with edible acorns, vide plinae. But by some unknown means it has become transferred to a tree whose fruit is far too bitter to be eaten by man. The red-flowered horse chestnut, Esculus carnea is a smaller and less vigorous tree, 
Its origin is unknown, but it is believed to be a garden hybrid that made its appearance about 1820. End of section 8. Section 9 of Wayside and Woodland Trees, A Pocket Guide to the British Silva, by Edward Stepp. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Exotic Trees and Shrubs, Part 2. The Bay Tree, Laurus Nobilis. The bay is the true laurel, of whose leaves and berries the wreaths were made in ancient days for poets and conquerors. Naturally, it is more of a shrub than a tree, for though it often attains a height of sixty feet, it persists in sending up so many suckers that the tree-like character is lost. In cultivation, however, it is often grown on a single stem, as well as formed by cutting into arbors and arches. We call to mind a Cornish village where a garden enclosure in its square, or plester, as Gilbert White would say, was surrounded by about a dozen bays so grown. Bays grow abundantly in the gardens of South Cornwall, and we always connected their general cultivation with the pilchard fishery. Certainly these trees in the plester were very convenient in the autumn and winter, for the leaves are an essential ingredient in the proper composition of that seductive dish, marinated pilchards, to which they impart their peculiar aromatic flavor. The bay is a native of southern Europe, whence it was introduced at some date prior to 1562. Prior says the name is the old Roman Baca, a berry, altered by the usual omission of C between the two vowels. This plant having become the Baca par excellence, because its berries were articles of commerce. The evergreen leaves are lance-shaped, without teeth, and arranged alternately on the branchlets. Not all the trees produce the berries, for the sexes are indistinct individuals, and all the white or yellowish four-parted flowers on one tree are stamen-bearing, whilst on another individual they all bear ovaries and no stamens. The berries at first green ultimately become of a dark purple hue. The flowers will be found in April or May, the ripe berries in October. The bay is grown chiefly as a shrubbery ornament and can only survive our winters out of doors in the south of England. Laburnum Laburnum vulgare Although the laburnums of our parks and gardens have all come from seed, and themselves produce an abundance of it, we do not meet with wayside escapes, as we might expect to do, having regard to the habit of the tree and the fact that it is comparatively indifferent respecting character of soil. Possibly a remark of Loudon's may explain this. He says that rabbits are exceedingly fond of the bark, and it may be that they destroy any young trees that are unprotected by palings or netting. The tree produces such a glorification of many an ordinary suburban road, when its flowering time comes round, that one would like to note its effect as a common object of the hillside and the woodland, against a background furnished by our more sober native trees. The laburnum is at home in the mountain forests of Central and Southern Europe, but there is no record of its introduction to Britain. We do know, however, that it has been with us for more than three centuries, for Gerard, in his Herbal, published 1597, refers to it as growing in his garden. It belongs to the great pea and bean family, Leguimosinae, and is very closely related to the common broom, whose solitary flowers those of the laburnum's drooping racemes nearly resemble. Ordinarily it is only a low tree of about twenty feet in height, but in favorable situations it may attain to thirty or more. Some of the larger laburnums, however, are of a distinct species. L. alpinus. The pale round branches are clothed with leaves that are divided into three oval lance-shaped leaflets, covered on the underside with silvery down. Both leaves and golden flowers appear simultaneously in May, but from the fact that the latter are gathered into numerous long pendulous racemes, their blaze of color makes the leaves almost invisible. Tennyson's description of its flowering, laburnum dropping wells of fire, is fine, but we rather prefer cowpers, rich in streaming gold, as embodying a more exact color idea. The flowers are succeeded by long, downy legumes or pods, like those of the bean and pea, 
containing many seeds which are of a dangerously violent emetic character when introduced to the human stomach the dark wood is of coarse grain but in spite of this hard and enduring and taking a good polish it is chiefly used by musical instrument makers turners and cabinet makers laburnum is the old latin name which is thus rather fancifully explained by prior an adjective from l labor denoting what belongs to the hour of labor and which may allude to its closing its leaflets together at night and expanding them by day common local names are golden chain suggested by the strings of flowers and bean trefoil and pea tree having reference to the leaves and legumes respectively the locust tree robinia pseudacacia although the locust or false acacia is little planted now it is only paying the penalty for having had its merits enormously exaggerated just as human reputations sometimes sink into oblivion after a season of popularity achieved by the persistent booming of influential friends the friend in this case was william cobbett who on his return from the united states about eighteen twenty preached salvation to the timber grower through the planting of robinia nothing in the timber way could be so great a benefit as the general cultivation of this tree so great was the demand thus created that cobbett himself started a nursery for the propagation and supply of robinias and so great is the virtue of a name that people refused the locust trees that every nurseryman had in stock and wished to sell and would be content with nothing but cobbett's robinias which could not be produced fast enough for the demand they thought it was an entirely new introduction though it had been grown in this country as an ornamental tree for nearly two centuries its wood is hard strong and durable but liable to crack and of limited utility the locust was introduced to europe from north america early in the seventeenth century and was then thought to be identical with the african acacia linnaeus named the genius in honor of jean robin a french botanist whose son an official at the jardin des plantes was the first to cultivate the tree in europe it is a tree of light and graceful proportions its branches being long and slender and the long narrow leaflets being broken up into a large number of small oval leaflets arranged pinnately that is feather wise the stipules which are found at the base of the leaf stalk in many plants are in this genus converted into sharp spines the flowers of similar pea shape to those of the laburnum are white and fragrant they are in long loose racemes which droop from the axils of the leaves in may the legumes are very thin and of a dark brown hue this was one of the first american trees introduced to europe and its name of locust came with it the missionaries believing it must be the tree upon whose fruit with the addition of wild honey john the baptist supported himself in the wilderness it is also known as silver chain in contradistinction to the gold chain or laburnum also as white laburnum the larch larix europea an enormous number of exotic coniferous trees are at the present time commonly grown in our parks and pleasure grounds and even our woods show a considerable variety beyond the scots pine and yew that nature has alone given us as timber trees in this order to attempt to give even a very brief account of all these in a pocket volume in addition to almost the entire woody flora indigenous to these islands would be manifestly absurd we can however deal with a few representative species of these exotics and we give the larch the first place by reason of its present plentifulness in extensive unmixed woods and plantations the larch is naturally a tree of the mountains and ascends to a greater elevation even than the spruce fir unmixed forests of larch in the bavarian alps occur between three thousand and six thousand feet above sea level and on the central swiss alps it ascends to nearly seven thousand feet a long winter of real cold is necessary for its full development and the ripening of its wood and for that reason the timber of the larch grown in england is inferior to that grown in its native countries because our winters are either short or mild and neither gives the tree the full rest it needs it is a european tree and was introduced though not in any numbers to england at some date prior to sixteen twenty nine for one hundred fifty years it appears to have been cultivated here merely as an ornamental garden tree then attention was called to its value as a timber tree and the society of arts offered gold medals for larch planting and essays upon its economic importance 
already 1728 the second duke of athol had begun those experiments in larch growing for timber which have been continued by his successors on a vast scale the fourth duke planting 27 million larch trees on 15000 acres of barren land their example has been copied on a smaller scale all over the country the larch is a lofty tree with a very straight tapering trunk ordinarily attaining a length between 80 and 100 feet but under very favorable conditions 120 feet with a girth of bole from 6 to 12 feet the brown bark is easily separable into thin layers and the growth of the tree causes it to split into deep longitudinal fissures the long lower branches are spreading with a downward tendency and the tips turned upward again the twigs are mostly pendulous and bear long and slender light green leaves in bundles of thirty or forty all the other families of coniferous trees are evergreen their leaves lasting for several years but at the beginning of winter the large leaves wither and fall and the larch wood takes on a more lifeless aspect than is assumed by any of our native trees in their leafless condition but in spring when the fresh green leaves are just showing and spreading tufts and the reddish purple female flowers tennyson's rosy plumelets hang brightly from the gaunt branches the larch wears an entirely different appearance and in summer the light grace of branches and foliage makes the larch a beautiful object that is one should say the trees that grow on the very outer edge of the wood or better still one that has been planted as a specimen tree where it has room to fling out its arms on all sides without touching anything and can get the abundant light it needs the straight rows in the plantation with every tree at an equal distance from its neighbors and its lower branches dead may be very pretty from the timber merchant's point of view but one likes to think of the tree as a living thing of beauty rather than as a detail in a factory where scaffold poles and telegraph posts are being grown to regulation size and shape the brown cones are egg-shaped little more than an inch in length the scales with loose edges the wood is very durable and it has the great recommendation of being fit for ordinary use when the tree is only forty years old it is most valuable for those purposes where exposure to all weathers is a necessity for it endures constant change from wet to dry large bark is used for tanning and venice turpentine is a product of the tree unlike most conifers it has the power of sending out new shoots when the branches have been removed close up to the stem large plantations sometimes present the appearance of death whilst they are still covered with foliage but the leaves are yellow and twisted this most frequently occurs in the case of trees between the ages of ten and fourteen years and is due to the depredations of a leaf mining caterpillar which ultimately changes into a minute moth the larch miner colophora laricella it feeds in the interior of the larch needles and therefore is beyond the reach of destruction except by felling and burning affected trees to prevent the spread of the pest its ravages keep the tree in ill health and apparently prepare the way for the deadly attack of another small enemy known as the larch canker the fungus paziza wilcomi sickly trees are also liable to the attentions of a wood wasp cyrix juvencus whose appearance is usually the cause of a little terror in nervous persons it has two pairs of smoky transparent wings and its stout straight blue body terminates in a long slender point its large white grub spends two or three years tunneling towards the heart of the tree and out to the bark again but rarely attacks sound trees it sometimes makes its appearance in a house from wood that has been used for building purposes the silver fir abes pectinata evelyn has left on record the fact that a two-year-old specimen of the silver fir was planted in harefield park near uxbridge in the year 1603 and this is usually regarded as the date of its introduction to england though the evidence is by no means conclusive its home is in the mountain regions of central and southern europe its highest range appears to be on the pyrenees where it is found at an elevation of six thousand five hundred feet forming pure forests of considerable area specimens have been recorded in southern germany that have attained a height of nearly two hundred feet but in this country a more usual stature is from one hundred to one hundred twenty feet with a bowl girth between ten and fifteen feet its trunk is straight and erect tapering gently and covered with smooth bark of grayish brown color which in aged specimens becomes rugged and fissured longitudinally as shown in our photo and of a silvery gray color 
it retains its lower branches for a period of forty to fifty years but after that age they begin to fall off whilst the tree is growing up which is roughly speaking during its first two hundred years the crown forms a slender bush but its vertical growth completed the crown grows laterally and becomes flat topped its life period covers about four hundred years the leaves are flat and slender not in bundles as in the scots pine but arranged along the branchlets in two or three dense ranks they are dark rich green above about an inch long and on the flattened underside there is a bluish white stripe on each side of the midrib which gives a silvery appearance to the foliage when upturned as is usual on the fertile branches these leaves endure from six to nine years the flowers appear in may at the tips of the branches the male flowers are about three-quarters of an inch long and consist of two or three series of overlapping scales enclosing the yellow stamens the cones are cylindrical with a blunt top always erect six to eight inches long and from one and one quarter to two inches in diameter on the back of each of the broad scales there is a long slender pointed bract which extends beyond the scale and turns downward at first these cones are green then become reddish and when mature are brown but maturity is not reached until eighteen months after their appearance the angular seeds are furnished with a broad wing twice their length they are shed by the cones in the spring following their maturity the scales following at the same time and leaving the core of the cone on the tree as a rule the tree does not produce fertile seeds until it is about forty years of age but seedless cones are formed from its twentieth year although the flowers of both sexes are found on the same tree it may be that for a series of years only cones are produced until the silver fir is about twelve years old its growth is slow and its annual increase is only a few inches but later it will be as many feet during this early stage spring frosts often destroy the leader shoot but its place is taken by another shoot and soon the symmetry of the tree is restored if this occurs at a later stage however the tree bears evidence of it in a forked trunk it is a deep rooting species with a branching tap root and succeeds best in an open soil that is moist without being wet the timber which has an irregular grain is strong and does not warp but it is soft and not enduring where it is exposed to the weather it is a yellowish white in color and is largely used for all interior work the spruce fir picea excelsa although we are compelled to class the spruce among introduced species it can lay claim to having been one of the older forest trees of britain for the upper beds of the tertiary formations contain abundant evidence that the spruce was a native here when those strata were laid down of its modern introduction there is no record but from mention of it by turner in his names of herbs in greek latin english etc we know that it was at some date anterior to the publication of that work 1548 it is widely distributed as a native tree throughout the continent of europe with the exception of denmark and holland it is the principal forest tree on the elevated tracts of germany and switzerland and on the central alpine ranges it reaches an altitude of six thousand five hundred feet it is an extremely variable tree but we cannot here deal with the varieties beyond saying that two principal forms different in habit and in timber are outwardly distinguished by one having red the other green cones the spruce fir is a tall and graceful tree with tapering trunk 120 to 150 feet in height though in this country its more usual stature when full grown would be about 80 feet high with a bowl circumference of about nine feet at first covered with thin smooth warm bark in later life this breaks up into irregular scales thin layers of which are cast off instead of a bushy crown as we see in the silver fir the spruce ends in a delicate spire so familiar in the christmas tree which is a spruce fir in the nursery stage the branches are in very regular tiers from base to summit and the branchlets go off almost opposite each other densely clothed with the short grass green needles these are from a half to three quarters of an inch in length four-sided and ending in a fine sharp point they endure for six or seven years the flowers are produced near the ends of last year's shoots those with stamens being born singly or in clusters of two or three they are about three-quarters of an inch in length and of a yellow color tinged with pink the cones which hang downwards are almost cylindrical about five inches long and one and one-half inches in diameter 
the pale brown scales are thin and loosely overlap the seeds of which there are two under each scale are very small with a transparent brown wing five times the length of the seed the flowers appear in may and the seeds are not ripe until nearly a year later the tree is a shallow rooter the roots going off horizontally in all directions a little below the surface and becoming intimately matted with those of neighboring trees this surface rooting often leads to disaster in plantations and forests of spruce for it is least able of all the firs to withstand a gale which will sometimes make a broad avenue through the plantation by toppling the trees one against another the wood of the spruce fir though light is even grained elastic and durable and the straightness of its stem makes it very valuable for all purposes where great length and straightness are required as for the masts of small vessels ladders scaffolding telegraph poles as well as for the varied uses the builder finds for its planks it supplies resin and pitch and most of the cheaper periodicals now issued largely owe their existence to the spruce for its fibers reduced to pulp are made into the paper upon which they are printed although its growth during the first few years is rather slow progress during the next twenty-five is tolerably rapid being at the rate of two or three feet per year if in a favorable situation and on moist light soil when grown in a wood the spruce loses its lower branches early but when given sufficient elbow room these remain to a good old age so that from spire to earth the graceful cone of the bright green is continuous the name spruce is from the german sprossen a sprout in allusion to the numerous short branchlets that are characteristic of the tree end of section nine Section 10 of Wayside and Woodland Trees, A Pocket Guide to the British Silva by Edward Stepp. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Exotic Trees and Shrubs, Part 3 The Douglas Fir Pseudotsuga douglasii Although the name of this tree in English and Latin might reasonably lead one to suppose that David Douglas, the intrepid botanical explorer, was the discoverer of it, that is not really so. It was Archibald Menzies who first made it known to science, by means of herbarium specimens collected in 1792, when, as the companion of Vancouver, he visited the western coasts of North America. But Douglas, in his capacity of collector to the Royal Horticultural Society, landed at Fort Vancouver on the Columbia River in 1825, and not only sent home herbarium species, but seeds also, of this and several previously unknown conifers. It was by means of these seeds that the Douglas fir was introduced to Britain. It was already known by Lambert's name of Abies taxifolia, but Dr. Lindley, a short time previous to Douglas's untimely death, selected the tree as a suitable and enduring memorial of the enormous services Douglas had rendered, and named it Abies Douglasi. Since then, Carrier has split up the old genus Abies and placed Douglasi in the new genus Pseudotsuga. Under the most favorable natural conditions, as around Puget Sound and on the western slopes of the Sierra Nevada, the Douglas fir grows to a height of 300 feet with a girth of 30 to 40 feet, but on the drier slopes of the Rocky Mountains it is not more than 100 feet high. In Colorado, forests of Douglas fir are found at an elevation of 11,000 feet. The tree has not been sufficiently long established in this country to say what dimensions it will reach, though it appears to have taken kindly to Ireland and to Devon and Cornwall, where the rate of growth of young trees is about 30 inches per annum. There are plenty of trees in these islands, planted about the year 1834, which have reached or passed 100 feet, and there is no doubt that towards our western coasts this height will be greatly exceeded. Some of these trees have long since produced cones, and from their seeds many young trees have been raised. The Douglas fir is of pyramidal outline, with the lowest branches bending to the ground under their weight of branchlets and leaves. Above, they spread horizontally, but the uppermost are more or less ascending. The branchlets are given off mostly in opposite pairs, densely clothed with slender, rich green leaves, three-quarters to one and one-quarter inches in length, paler beneath. They endure for six or seven years and are arranged in three or four ranks. 
the male flowers will be found clustered at intervals on the underside of the previous year's shoots whilst the cones are formed at the tips of the lateral branchlets and hang downwards these cones are somewhat elliptical in outline from two and one half to four inches long with large scales and from the back of each there extends a three-clawed bract whereof the middle claw or on is very long several well-marked varieties of the douglas fir are also to be met with occasionally in parks and gardens the douglas fir produces excellent timber and is a most valuable forest tree not only on that account but because of its adaptability to varying conditions of soil and climate it is the most widely distributed of all american forest trees and the area of its distribution is spread over thirty two degrees of latitude and from end to end of this range it has in the words of sargent to endure the fierce gales and long winters of the north and the nearly perpetual sunshine of the mexican cordilleras to thrive in the rain and fog which sweep almost continuously along the pacific coast range and on the arid mountain slopes of the interior where for months every year rain never falls it appears to thrive best where the air is humid and the soil well drained it begins to bear cones about its twenty-fifth year the straight tapering trunk is largely used for the masts and spars of ships its suitability for this purpose being evident to all visitors to Kew who have gazed at the flagstaff set up in the arboretum. This pole is 159 feet long with a circumference of 6 feet at the base, tapering to 2 feet 2 inches at the top, and weighing about 3 tons. It was brought from Vancouver Island, and an examination of its rings before it was set up showed that it represented the growth of about 250 years. The full life of the Douglas fir is estimated to be about 750 years. The Stone Pine, Pinus Pinea. Between the tall, graceful spire of the Douglas fir and the squat, heavy, umbrella-like head of the Stone Pine, there is an enormous contrast. It must be confessed that the Stone Pine is less beautiful than picturesque, a point that strongly commends it to the landscape painter working in the countries bordering the Mediterranean in which region it is native the date of its introduction to britain is not known but it has been in cultivation here certainly for more than three centuries and a half for turner mentions it in his names of herbs in greek latin english dutch and french published in 1548 in its native countries it attains to a height of 60 to 80 feet but in this country the finest examples are only about 35 feet whilst ordinary british grown examples are only half that height its trunk covered with rugged and deeply fissured thick red-gray bark forks at no great distance from the roots and sends off massive spreading branches of great length for several years the young tree produces short single leaves but later leaves are five or six inches long slender and of a bright green tint in pairs united at their base by a pale sheath these leaves endure for two or three years the pollen bearing flowers are crowded into a spike the female flowers are about three-quarters of an inch long, composed of pale greenish scales. After fertilization, these grow to a length of four to six inches, of a rugged oval form and red-brown color, ripening in the third year. The scales of these cones are somewhat wedge-shaped with a stout rhomboid boss, which has a depression round the central protuberance. The seeds which are eaten for dessert and preserved as sweetmeats in countries where the stone pine is native are enclosed in a bony shell and it is from this circumstance that the tree gets its name the austrian pine pinus laricio what is known as the austrian pine is a variety of the corsican or larch pine and its botanical name correctly set out is pinus laricio var austriaca the name has reference to the fact that its chief home as an indigenous tree is in the southern provinces of the austrian empire the range of the type and its varieties together includes central and southern europe and part of western asia it is a comparatively recent addition to our silva in both forms for the type that was introduced in 1759 in the belief that it was a maritime form of the scots pine but the variety austriaca was first sent out by lawson and son the edinburgh nurserymen in 1835 the typical species corsican pine is a slender tree of somewhat pyramidal form growing to the height of 80 to 120 feet 
the austrian pine though a large tree is of smaller proportions from sixty to eighty feet high but with stouter and longer branches and denser foliage the leaves which vary from three to five inches in length are sheathed in pairs convex on the outer side rigid glossy dark green and with toothed margins the cone is conical with a rounded base two to three inches in length and its position on the branch is almost horizontal the scales somewhat smaller to those of the scots pine but with stronger bosses and of a yellowish brown color polished it takes about seventeen months to become full grown and ripen the seeds the austrian pine is one of those that do well on poor soils and takes kindly to chalk from the density of its foliage it makes a good shade and shelter tree its timber though coarse in grain is very durable and useful for outside work cedar of lebanon cedrus libani made familiar by name at least from very early times by frequent references to it in the books of the old testament it is rather strange that so hardy a tree was not one of the first of those introduced for ornament into britain it is true that local legends attaching to some old cedars in this country credit them with having been planted in the spacious times of great elizabeth as the great cedar at witten middlesex blown down in 1779 but on the other hand we have the fact that no mention is made of the cedar by john elvelin in his silva 1664 this it is true is only negative evidence but it is strong none the less for it is not at all likely that so keen and pious an arboriculturist would have omitted mention of so noteworthy a tree had it been growing here when he wrote there is reason to believe however that the still existing enfield cedar was planted about the date of evelyn's publication by dr uvedale master of the enfield grammar school the researches of sir j d hooker subsequent to his memorable expedition to lebanon and taurus in 1860 established the specific identity of the three cedars known as the mount atlas cedar the cedar of lebanon and the doadar though the arboriculturalist still treats them as distinct species they are scientifically regarded as geographical forms of one species for convenience we here adopt the arboriculturalist's view the cedar varies greatly no tree more so in height and general outline according to situation and environment and though the stature of well-grown trees in this country may be correctly stated as from fifty to eighty feet we are not without examples of one hundred and one hundred twenty feet where the conditions have been specially favorable there is one of one hundred twenty feet at strathfield say and among the numerous fine cedars at godwood there is the celebrated great cedar ninety feet high with a bowl twenty-five feet in circumference and a broad conical head whose base has a diameter of one hundred thirty feet but the cedar as usually seen on lawns and in parks has a low rounded or flattened top the great spreading arms having grown more rapidly than the trunk thus grown the huge bowl has seldom any great length throwing out these timber branches at from six to ten feet from the ground and immediately afterwards the trunk is divided into several stems from these the main branches take a curving direction at first ascending but the part furthest from the trunk becoming almost horizontal it is chiefly at the extremity of the branches that the branchlets and leaves are produced the evergreen leaves last for three four or five years and are of needle shape varying in length from a little less to a little more than an inch they are produced in a similar manner to those of the larch in tufts that are arranged spirally round dwarf shoots mostly on the upper side of the branchlets the male flowers are to be found at the extremity of branchlets which though six or seven years old are very short their development having been arrested the solid purple-brown cones are only three or four inches long broad-topped and with a diameter of about half the length the scales thin and closely pressed together they are at first grayish green tinged with pink the development and maturity of these cones takes two or three seasons and they remain on the tree for several years longer the seeds are angular with a wedge-shaped wing the trees do not produce cones until they are from twenty-five to thirty years old but they may be a century old before producing either male or female flowers the trunk is covered with thick rough deeply fissured bark on the branches the bark is smooth and peels off in thin flakes the cedar in its native habitat produces admirable timber but that of the trees grown in our own country is described by loudon as reddish white 
light and spongy easily worked but very apt to shrink and warp and by no means durable for these reasons the tree is grown almost solely for ornament the name cedar is supposed to be derived from the arabic kedrum or kedre power and has reference to its majestic proportions and strong timber the deodar or indian cedar cedrus deodara although as we have indicated the differences between the cedar of lebanon and the cedar of himalaya are not such as can be scientifically accepted as constituting specific distinctness they are sufficient to at once strike the ordinary observer in proportion to the height of the trunk for example the main branches are much shorter the result being a more regular pyramidal outline terminating in a light spire the terminal shoots of the branches are longer more slender and quite pendulous these differences though really slight transform the rather heavy majesty of the cedar as represented by c Libani, into one of graceful beauty although the experience of sixty years has sadly falsified the high hopes entertained as to the suitability of the deodar for cultivation in this country as a timber tree its value for ornamental purposes and in landscape gardening has not been impaired the headquarters of the deodar are in the mountains of northwest india where it forms forests at various altitudes above three thousand five hundred feet its vertical distribution indeed extends to a height of twelve thousand feet but its principal habitat lies between six thousand and ten thousand feet deodar timber produced in its native forests is exceedingly durable being compact and even grained not liable to warp or split and standing the test of being alternately wet and dry loudon states that when a building which had been erected by the emperor akbar in the latter part of the sixteenth century was pulled down between eighteen twenty and eighteen twenty five the deodar timber used in its construction was found to be so sound that it was again used in building a house for raja shah and brandis tells of very much more ancient bridges in srungar whose piers are of deodar wood and appear to be as yet unaffected by decay it is to the hon w l melville that we are indebted for the introduction of the deodar to britain in eighteen thirty one and during the next ten years many young trees were raised here from seeds favorably impressed by the rapidity of growth of these seedlings the government fearing a coming shortage of oak for naval purposes imported and distributed large numbers of deodar seeds and high estimates were formed of the future value of these trees but in framing these estimates one important factor was omitted the uncertainty of the british climate with its rapid changes everything by turns and nothing long a score or two of years served to demonstrate that such conditions were opposed to the longevity and uniform development that produced sound timber on the indian mountains and today the deodar is not mentioned among the trees that are to bring riches to the british timber grower in spite of this failure there are to be seen in many parts of these islands fine young deodars of forty or fifty years and from fifty to seventy feet in height there is no necessity for repeating the particulars already given respecting the cedar of lebanon which apply to the cedar of deodar with such modifications as are indicated in the first paragraph above specimens grown where they have sufficient space for spreading out their long arms retain their branches to the base of the trunk and if these are cut off they can reproduce them several nursery varieties with golden aurea silvery argentia or the more intense green viridis foliage than the type have appeared as a result of european cultivation lawson's cypress lawson's cypress cupressus lawsoniana lawson's cypress belongs to that section of conifers which includes the junipers and thuias and is a representative of the north american silva it is a native of south oregon and north california where it is believed to have been first discovered by jeffrey about eighteen fifty two two years later seeds were received by messrs lawson the edinburgh nurserymen from mr william murray and from these seeds were raised the first young trees of this species sent out by the firm the name was bestowed in honor of mr charles lawson then the head of the firm and by this name it is generally known in europe but in the united states it is the port orford cypress at port orford on the oregon coast according to sargent it forms one of the most prolific and beautiful coniferous forests of the continent unsurpassed in the variety and luxuriance of its undergrowth of rhododendrons vacciniums raspberries buckthorns and ferns 
and any one who has seen well-grown specimens in the pleasure grounds of this country can easily realize something of the beauty of such a forest though allowance has to be made for the fact that in forest growth the lower branches are lost at an early age in its native home the lawson cypress attains a height of between 120 and 150 feet occasionally reaching 200 feet with a base circumference of 40 feet the thick brown bark splits into rounded scaly ridges the short horizontal branches divide a good deal towards their leafy extremities which are curved and commonly drooping the leaves are little evergreen scales which overlap and being closely pressed to the branchlet completely clothe and hide it they are bright dark green in color and endure for three or four years the male flowers are produced at the tips of short branchlets formed a year earlier they are of cylindric form crimson in color and each stamen bears from two to six anther cells the small cones are more or less globular but instead of a large number of spirally arranged overlapping scales as in the pines and firs here there are only eight whose edges at first join to form a box when the cone is ripe these scales separate to allow the escape of the seeds the lawson cypress produces a valuable wood close grained and strong yet light it is considered one of the most important timber trees of north america but in this country it has been planted solely with a view to its ornamental qualities its perfect hardiness and its freedom of growth may with longer experience than half a century affords lead to its being regarded as a timber producer here also the common cypress cupressus sempervirens of the mediterranean region and the east of which poets have sung in all ages has been cultivated in this country for at least three hundred and fifty years the chili pine aracaria imbricata the chili pine or monkey puzzle is a familiar sight on suburban lawns where however it seldom attains a large size or long retains health the lower branches drop off and the upper ones become brown as though scorched but away from the smoke-laden atmosphere and uncongenial soils some handsome and massive aracarias may be seen rising from fair lawns with dense branches curving at their tips and regularly disposed in whorls from the dome-like head of the tree to the grass at its base such was the magnificent specimen at dropmore that died in 1902 such is the fine tree at woodstock county kilkenny which now presumably takes the position of eminence in these islands hitherto held by the dropmore example the chili pine is a native of southern chile where it was discovered by a spaniard don f dendarriera in 1780 as he was prospecting for timber about the same time two other spaniards doctors ruiz and pavon were botanizing in chile and came across the aracaria of which they sent herbarium specimens to europe but in spite of this threefold opportunity for spain the actual introduction of the aracaria to europe must be credited to britain Archibald Menzies, who accompanied Captain Vancouver as botanist on his celebrated voyage, came across the tree in Chile and brought home both seeds and young plants. One of these became a fine tree at Kew, where it was for many years the object of admiration and interest, but it perished in 1892. The Araucaria forms extensive pure forests in the province of Aracaro, from which it gets its name and to whose inhabitants the seeds are a most important item of their food supply not only do the trees in these forests lose their lower branches but even those growing in the open plains of their native country have similarly bare trunks for nearly half their height it is therefore a satisfaction to know that the finest specimens grown in this country have really surpassed those grown in their natural home the height reached by old trees is from eighty to one hundred feet with a trunk girth of from sixteen to twenty three feet the tapering of this trunk is very slight and a few of the stiff spine-tipped leaves with which its younger extremity is densely clothed still remain attached in a dried-up condition far down the column these leaves will have been observed to entirely cover the branches not being restricted as in most trees to the newly formed branchlets and twigs these are very hard and endure for about fifteen years are about an inch and a quarter long and overlap though their sharp pointed ends turn away from the branch the cylindrical male flowers are four or five inches long born singly or in small clusters it was formerly supposed that the sexes were on separate trees but though many individuals only produce flowers of one kind this is by no means the general rule 
the female flowers are about four inches long almost round in shape but broader at the base than above they are covered with long narrow overlapping scales beneath which are found the seeds when the flower has developed into the brown cone which is six inches in diameter the scales are then easily detached in fact when the seeds are ripe the cone falls to pieces the seed is about an inch and a half long enclosed in a hard thin shell the chili pine does not succeed in this country unless it is given pure air sunshine abundant moisture and an open subsoil to carry it off yet it will grow to a very handsome tree if these conditions are observed very fine effects have been obtained in some places by planting an araucaria grove such an avenue is in fine condition at woodstock county kilkenny running parallel with an avenue of abis nobilis every tree with its branches intact from turf to summit and bearing fertile cones there is a similar but less perfectly preserved araucaria grove at bicton in devonshire end of section 10 end of wayside and woodland trees a pocket guide to the british silva by edward stepp